today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to go from this through to this. Now I've used a couple programs to make this image. For modeling, I used Rhino 3D. I have version 6, but any version should work. I used V-Ray for the renderer. However, you could probably do the same thing in Lumion or Enscape and Photoshop. Finally, I composed the image in an InDesign document, but you could do this step inside Photoshop as well. Okay, so now we've got our model open in Rhino. What you're going to want to start thinking about is composing your view and what kind of camera location you're going to want. At the moment, it's a bit hard to tell what it's going to look like as a final render, given the current view settings with all the lines and face edges and shading. So a way to quickly preview what a render might look like inside Rhino without having to open up any of your render software is just change the viewport setting. So you can either just type set display mode and change the mode to something like Arctic. And another way to quickly do this is right click on the title of the viewport and you can get through all the options here. I like Arctic because it's just kind of like a quick preview of a white card model render. Now you can start to kind of pan and zoom around your model and get to something that you like. Now for my rendering I'm going to be doing an isometric view. Now the way to set up an isometric view in Rhino is just right click again on the viewport name, go to set view isometric and you've got the four options of the four cardinal diagonal so just click through them and select the one you like for me it was southwest now you can pan and zoom in here and it will remain in isometric you just need to remember that if you start to orbit around the model it will no longer be isometric it'll be a two-point projection but it won't be a perfect isometric so just go back and set the view again to what you had before now a quick tip in here is when you start playing around with views and you get to one that you like and you want to save it, go to the right side of the window where the little cog icon is in the toolbar and go to named views. Now once that window opens up, the icon's a little camera, you just click the little save icon, type in a name and that will set your view save. So you can go around and move and change and whatever and go straight back to the view by double clicking on it. Now once you've kind of got a view that you like and you've got it saved up in the top right, we're going to start thinking about rendering. Now you can turn the Arctic viewport shading off back to shaded now if you like to get your computer running a bit quicker. At this point what you want to do is just start putting in the settings for the render. So in the asset editor make sure your engine is set to GPU. If you've got a graphics card at the moment we'll turn on interactive just so we can tweak some final changes in the render before we do a final, turn the denoiser on, render output, we want to set it to 1920 by 1080 at the widescreen 16 to 9 aspect ratio, we want to turn the material override on, now I have my material override colour as a little bit grey but you can change it to white or whatever you like later, now under camera the exposure value that's what we're going to change to control the lighting of the scene and the white balance if your render is a bit too red or blue but we're going to get most of that out in post-processing anyway so once all your settings are in just click the render with V-Ray Interactive to do a quick little test render okay so now you can see we've got the interactive render window open and what that means is you can still change your view etc in Rhino and it will automatically update now in this render we're going to be using the sun as our light source so to get the sun options up in Rhino go to the little cog on the right hand side go to Sun make sure it's set to on and I like to use manual control so you can tweak it now you can use this Sun position which sets where north is and the position on the right is the vertical angle of the Sun so you can tweak that a little bit and obviously the higher the Sun the brighter it will be and the lower down it will be a bit more afternoon looking so just tweak those settings till you get a view that you like and the shadows in the direction that you want as well. So I'm going to look for a little bit of a longer shadow kind of to the rear and to the bottom right of the scene. So something like that. Now let's say your render was too bright or too dark. What you do is go into the camera exposure settings and just change these numbers here. So a lower number is a brighter scene and a higher number is a darker scene. So just have a play around with those to get the settings you like. Now the white balance, that makes your image more red or more blue. So if it's more, if it's too red, you want to increase the orangey redness. And if it's too blue, 
you want to increase the amount of blue that you're adding to the white balance. So just kind of tweak around with that. Don't worry too much about getting it perfect. We're going to fix that up in post-production anyway. Now, just before you start your final render, there's going to be a few things you want to add to your V-Ray render output just to help in post-processing. And these are extra render elements. So you can go to this little layer looking icon and add a few of these elements here. Now, what these do is these render out a separate pass or different type of image when you're completing your render. So the ones I like to use are render ID, I'll do a shadow, maybe a lighting. So now once you've got all of those in and you render out your image, we'll have a look at what all those different passes are and then talk about post-processing in Photoshop. So now once you've got a rendering scene that you're all happy with and you're ready to do a final render, go back to the V-Ray Asset Editor, scroll to the top under Render, make sure you've stopped your interactive render, turn off interactive, turn on denoise and put the quality to very high or high depending on the quality of your computer. Click the render with V-Ray button and that will start render and you'll just have to wait. Okay, so once your render has completed in the V-Ray VFB, you can see in the top left this little drop down, that's telling you what's being shown in the window. Now those extra element passes that we added to the render can be seen in this drop down as well. So if you change to the render ID, you can see it's given all the different objects in the render a different color. Now this is really helpful for post-processing and quickly masking out elements. You can see the lighting, that kind of black and whites out the shadows. This is really helpful for isolating out shadows as elements. So once your render result is all finished in the renderer, now to save it out, as you know, we've got a few extra passes. If you just click this save current channel, that will only save the render result. If you want to save them all as separate images, click and hold on the save icon and go to the save all image channels to separate files and away you go. Okay, so now we're moving on to post-processing and we're going to be using Photoshop. So we're just going to want to load in all of those images into one file from the renderer that we just exported. Now you could open them all individually and copy them into the new document or we can use this quick little tip to open a lot of pictures into one drawing at once. So you go to File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack and browse through your computer to find the renders that you want. Just select them all. You want all those passes plus the final result. Click OK. That will add them to the list. And just click OK. OK, so as you can see, all the images have now finished loading into this document. And we've got the lighting layer, which we're going to use to isolate and control out the shadows independently of the background. We're going to use the render ID to help isolate out individual aspects of our design or other things you need to quickly mask out. And we've got shadows here just in case as well, but we'll probably just end up using lighting. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is isolate out a mask to control the lighting of the shadows. And that's so we can light the overall image independently of the shadow darkness. So just click the lighting layer visible. Uh, use the magic wand tool by pushing W. Make sure the lighting layer is selected. Right click, color range. Click in a spot on the image where the shadow was, and as you can see in this little box here, you see all the little white areas are the parts that will be selected. Click OK, and as you can see, that's pretty much isolated out all the shadows. So now what you want to do is just click the mask icon in the bottom right, add layer mask, and that will isolate out the shadows. And as you can see, that's essentially given us a layer that just has the shadows. And you can change the opacity of that layer to change the brightness of the shadow. Okay, so now we're going to start changing the lighting and white balance of this image. Now, what I do for that is I select the effects result, which is the base final outcome of the render. Go to the adjustments panel and start using things like brightness and contrast to affect the overall brightness of the image and contrast will change the difference between the shadows and the light areas. Now I like to have this not too contrasty, kind of a little bit more washed out, but you want to make sure you can still distinguish between the buildings and the ground and stuff like that. So just have a play around with these settings until you get somewhere that you're happy with. You might use the levels as well to change the lower and upper limits of the darkness and brightness. Now you can kind of bring the brightness down a little bit if you want your image to be a little bit more white overall. As you can see, mine's still a bit dark. 
Now, if your image is a bit too blue or a bit too red, go into the color and saturation window and have a play around with the sliders in here. Now, another tip is I like to select all the adjustment layers and put them into a group so that I can quickly see before and after by turning that group on and off. I like to rename the group adjustments and you can give that layer a color if you like by right clicking and selecting a color. I typically like to have that layer at the top so it's applied to all elements. We're going to add an accent color just over our portion of this design, not worrying about any of the context. Now the way we're going to quickly isolate that is using the lasso tool. Now I like to use the polygonal lasso tool, so that's up here in the left, you can push L. If it's not polygonal, you can right click on the lasso icon and change it to the polygonal one. Now what you want to do is go through and trace the outline of your part of the project. Now you can take as long as you want with this. I tend to not be too accurate because you're not going to be able to really tell if the edges are really precise or not. You can always clean it up later. So just go through and trace the edges with a lasso tool. Make sure you get the whole lot. Now that we've got our portion of the project selected, the way we're going to add a colour is add an overlay to the image and mask it so it only applies to our portion of the project. So go down to the bottom and create a new layer, then click the Add Mask tool. Now that will mask out that layer. You can't see anything at the moment. But what you want to do is make sure that the layer is selected on the left, not the mask, and then select a colour that you want to use for your accent. Now I'm going to go with a blue. And what I do is I just use grab the brush tool with B and just paint over your entire portion of the image. Just put it in full opacity, full hardness. We're going to change it all later. So just get in there and paint it up fully. Now, once you've applied the accent color to your portion of the image, as you can see, it's blocky and we don't want it to look like that for the final. So what I tend to do is go to the layer style, click the drop down and have a look through here. You might want to use something like a lighten or a screen, maybe overlay. I think I'll probably go with a lighten. And as you can see, that's pretty contrasty. And if you want it to be more or less intense, use the opacity slider on that layer to bring it up or down in brightness and intensity. And just have a play around with that until you're happy with it. Now, once you've applied the color to our portion of this project, you might want to go back and tweak some of the adjustments we had before around the background. So once we've got this image where we want it and we're happy with it all, uh, you could just simply export it out of Photoshop as it is now as an image. If you wanted to do that, go to File, Export, Export As, and change the format and size. I generally leave the image size either the same or 8% less than the render image was so if you rendered a 1920 by 1080 make the final image 1920 by 1080 or do a reduction if you needed to crop the image you could crop it inside Photoshop using the crop tool just push C and drag these handles around to crop it to a final dimension click OK and export or save as same as what we just did but what the way I work is I would just save this document as it is now just a file save save as, save it as the Photoshop document and I would place that Photoshop document straight into an InDesign file or something like that that I was using to lay it out. So if you're going to do that, just jump into InDesign. I'd place that Photoshop file straight into the InDesign file. So just hit Control D or Command D and place that file in. Just click on the screen. As you can see, it's quite large. Use the Align tool to get it on the page and just scale it down to the size roughly that you're going to want. Now let's say you wanted to crop this, the way you do that is you just click on the image, then click on this little circle in the center and what that does is crops the image on the inside of the view frame. So just kind of scale that up and around to the fitting you want. You can drag it inside that frame. Once you're happy with it, just click out and away you go. I'll quickly preview it. Pretty happy with that. Something that I'd add to this image, which I won't show you how to do now, but I'll show you how to do in a later video, so check back in the channel on that one, will be a line work drawing. The way I'd get that is just a simple make 2D command in Rhino, and then I'd export that out to 
Illustrator and then straight back into InDesign. So I'll just pop that in with the place command, place that over the top, and I'll just move that one around on screen until it's in the spot that I want. And once that's in the, where you want it, I'd probably add a bit of text down the bottom and you're pretty much finished. For everyone who's made it this far, a big thank you for watching the video. Hope you liked it. Any comments or questions, just hit me in the comments below. Cheers and see you in the next one.